Welcome to another episode of Inside the Banjoverse. I am your host, Ender Scal, and firstly, a huge shout out to all the patrons of the podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast, head over to patreon.com forward slash Enda Scal Banjo. And while you're there, you never know, you might decide to learn the banjo, and if so, you'll be in the right place. My guest on this episode is Mick O'Connor. Mick is a banjo player from London, an absolute gentleman in every fashion. Uh, we had an amazing talk. <laughs> Mick could literally go for hours. He has so many stories. He knows so many people. Brilliant uh, composer of tunes. A great lover of everything Irish, and particularly Irish music and Irish banjo. An absolute sweetheart. And we had just the greatest conversation. And I know that you're going to enjoy this episode of the podcast with the great Mick O'Connor. To, to start your story, uh, how far back do you want to go? Oh, I sp- well, I was just thinking, and I suppose, really, the um, going back to, uh, uh, of course, my parents are both Irish. My mother's from uh, Tralee. My mother from, was from Tralee and my father from Roscommon. And they used to, obviously, used to sing Irish little bits of songs to me. And so I had the love of Irish music and song and everything from a young age. Uh and then when we eventually, uh, well, my mother's, my mother's, my auntie, my mother's sister, and my father's brother could both play the accordions, both play the accordion. And when I was 11, then we went to a party in the next door neighbours in the next street, party in the next street. And I was so impressed by the son of the family. Suddenly he said, Frank, get up, you play us the tune on the accordion. I thought, and he came up with this accordion. He, he, I was 11 then, he was 10. And I was totally, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. Look at him on that button accordion. Oh, Dad, I've got to have an accordion. So I played me Dad, you know, for weeks and months after. Dad, could I have an accordion? So Dad had to save up, you know. And then eventually he bought me a Hona, not a black dot, which would have been the one in the right pitch, constant pitch, constant switch. Uh, he bought me an, a Hona Erica, E-R-I-C-A, and it was it would mean that I'd have to put a capital on the third fret if I knew about the things like that then and play normally. You know, so if we played Christmas Eve, if my, if somebody played on that accordion, I'd have to put a capital on the third fret to play it. So, um, anyway. So, uh, where, where where was all of this and what, what year are we talking oh, about? We uh, couldn't wait uh, the age, Mick. Oh, yeah. Well, I was, bo- I was born in 1900 and frozen to death. So I was born in... I was, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. And uh, I was born in 19... 19- I was going to say 70 then. I'd be, a young, I'd, I'd be still older than you. I was born in 1950. The 1950s, and that was only five years after the Second World War. 1950, and there it was. Uh, and um, growing up, I've lived all my life in the one town here in Kilburn, London, which you, 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 you've you been to. I'm sure you've been to Kilburn when you've come to London. There was so many Irish here in those years, uh, the 50s and 60s, full of Irish. You'd hear just nearly all Irish accents, you know. Wonderful place. And so, um, as I say, when I was about uh, 10, got that accordion, but I tried for a few weeks to play it, gave up. I thought, how do I learn this? And then I, the year before that, I nearly bought the a dr- set of drums from the boy next door. Thank God they didn't. You didn't, cried the neighbours, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't buy them because I looked at them and I thought, I was, you know, was getting into the pop music then, sort of, or maybe. And... Um, I thought when I looked at the drums, I thought, no, they don't look very good. They don't look like, um, well, who was it? Cliff Richard and the Shadows or whoever I was working at. <laughs> you know, and so I didn't buy them. And, and uh, so carried things carried on then until I was about 14, still in Kilburn, County Kilburn. And uh, about 16 or 17, my friend taught me some chords on the guitar. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. And I, and I tried singing then. Uh, we were at school. And um, uh, I, I, my friend had brought back a record of the Rocky Road to Dublin from uh, from when he was in visiting his cousins, and, uh, and I thought he said, "Mick, you like the banjo, don't you?" Oh yeah, here's a single, a final single, the Rocky Road to Dublin, the Dublins, you know. And I, I thought, oh, that's wonderful. Um, anyway, that I, d- I didn't make any more of a move there. We 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 had, our first records came into our house were uh, an LP of Bridie Gallagher, the girl from Donegal, the singer. Jimmy Shand, the famous uh, Scottish band that all the Irish loved. We all loved him. He was 
still holds the record for one of the biggest crowds ever in the famous Irish dance hall called the Gelty Moor. Massive crowds, you know, because he was on the television so much, Jimmy Shand. And um, and the next one was a, a nearer to you then, an LP of um, St. Patrick's Night in Dublin with the Bell and the Kill Cayley Band, recorded probably about 1960, early 60s. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, that's fantastic. It was Aggie White was in that. I'm sure you've heard of Aggie White. I met Aggie White in Galway, not too far from, you know, where you, where you are. Uh, uh, and were those, uh, that was all on on, uh, on vinyl, of course. Vinyl? Oh, yeah, did, vinyl. Did you buy them? Or, did, you know, you, you know, you hear the stories in Ireland about people traveling around with with the vinyl records and going from house to house playing them. How, how did that operate for you? Oh, well, I suppose was trying to save up to buy them. I'm sure my parents bought those ones. Uh, and when we got the record player, which is about 61, 1961, that was a fantastic thing to have them. So parents bought them, but I thought, this is really wonderful music. Uh, uh, little did I know that I'd meet Eddie White. That that was 60, well, that was 62 or 3, we had that. Seven or, in the early 70s, I met Eddie White in London. She came over and it was a wonderful fiddle player from Galway. Uh, I, she'd be from East Galway, wouldn't she? She'd be near to Bell, for Bell and Achille area, I'm sure she was. Uh, and then all those wonderful people I met. Um, uh, so, you, little do you think, you know, when you're, you know, you're, you're listening to these records as a, as a child, as a very young person, and then later, these people that you listen to on records, you're going to meet them, and they might become your friends. Oh, this is fantastic, isn't it? And when I, when uh, and, and in your in, in your case, make them that they become your fans. <laughs> <laughs> in my dreams, they did. <laughs> but not in reality. <laughs> they, they probably saw me and said, oh, there's Mick O'Connell on the other side of the street. Let's go into this shop. <laughs> get away. <laughs> no, no, let's go into that pub and get away from <laughs> Let him go into the other place. <laughs> but, um, but no, uh, it was just uh, uh, another memory I have, uh, Ender, is about 64 or 5. Where we lived in Kilburn then, uh, in the first place we lived in, that we were right next to a park, the Grange Park, and there was we were a, a, a sort of five or six hundred yards away from a pub on the Kilburn High Road called the Black Lion, which, unknown to me, fa- famous people would play there: Michael Gorman, Maggie Barry, Martin Burns, uh, uh, or now uh, the man from. Uh, and now I'm just trying to think. Lots of people: Jimmy Power, Reg Hall, all these famous. This was a really fantastic, beautiful pub in Kilburn with the ornate glass and the lovely plastered ceiling. That's really a work of art, preservation order on it, on it now. Um, and we'd hear the music coming across on the wind Saturday evening, and I'd say to my mum, "Oh, that's where's that coming from? That's wonderful, isn't it?" Open the window a bit more. Well, I don't know where that's coming from. Well, it was coming from this pub, the Black Lion. So that was 64, 65. Little did I know that, well, 60, I, I got my first banjo in, uh, I got a mandolin first about 68. I mean, my first banjo was 69, 1969. And um, do, do you remember what kind of banjo it was? Yeah, my first banjo uh, end of was a, my very first was a five string because I didn't know the difference. I thought, five string, that's a banjo. It's got to be okay, hasn't it? It's got to be. And anyway, I bought it. It was a Windsor Zither banjo, which as it turns out, was almost as it was a, a, the, virtually the same. I think it was exactly the same as the one Margaret Barry played, and may have even seen a picture of Luke Kelly playing one of those. Uh, and also, uh, and if you've ever read about um, Scott and Shackleton going to the South Pole, yeah. and the the Kerry man Tom Crean that went with them, would you believe it? I'm so interested in that that I've composed a jig um, in, in memory of Tom Crean. Uh, uh, Eddie, best I can. I hope it's okay. It's a jig, and I call it the unsung hero, which is the name of uh, the the book, one of the books about Tom Crean from yeah. London. I I actually would you believe uh, recently, just in the last couple of months, and uh, RT Lyric FM, which is the classical music station in Ireland, they did a documentary about Shackleton, and about the but specifically about the music and the banjo that was on the on the endurance, oh. and so. I borrowed a zither banjo from Tom Cusson at, at Clarion Banjos, yes. and 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 so the, the the people who were making the documentary came to the house, and yeah. and I I played some of the banjo tracks, some of the music that w- that they would have sang on, on the boat, and and they put this radio documentary together. It's fantastic. It was a really exciting thing to do. 
Oh, wonderful. Endo, would I be able to... That's a radio documentary. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link to that. Would you send me the link? Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Because, uh, Endo, I'm so interested in that. I, I went to the... When they bought the, the Unsung Hero was was uh, law, sort of a, a, launch, a launch in London, uh, my, Michael Smith, I went to that and it was fantastic, his talk on, on Michael. Bought the book. That gave me the idea. Then when I got an idea for a Jake for a tune, I call it the Unsung Hero. Um... But I went to a couple of different exhibitions, one at the Maritime Museum in London in Greenwich, and that banjo was there. That banjo that went with them. I, I couldn't believe it. I went around the exhibition and I was thinking, oh, God, it's nearly closing time now. I think I've seen all the rooms. Five. Oh, what about that room over there? I thought, I don't think I saw that room. Would you believe it? I went in that room. I thought, what's this? The banjo. The banjo. I, I could have missed it. It was in a glass case. Well, you know the, what? You know what? Yeah, you know what you know what Shackleton said when when they were finally rescued, and he insisted that the banjo come with them. And, and of course, you know the amount of weight that they were able to bring with them was, was oh, yes. important. But he said the the banjo was vital mental medicine. Yes, oh, no, that's fantastic. I, re I remember that. I thought, what a lovely thing. Um, so, isn't it amazing? The same banjo, almost certainly a Windsor the banjo. I went to with with the with I've forgotten the name of the man that pl that, that played it for them. Um, and Margaret Barry played one. It was the first banjo I ever got. But there was a lot of them. Windsor's the banjo. I think they were made in Birmingham. Birmingham, nice banjos. Uh, the back couldn't come off. It was it was all one piece, wasn't it? Yeah. So you 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 loaned one from Tom Cousin. Ah uh, well, and I, I I'm so I'm, I'm I'm so delighted that you that you were involved in that. Um, and I'd love to hear. You'll send me the link. That'll be fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. So when, um, when when did you realize that it was a five string and that <laughs> you were going after it all wrong? I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> I woke, it was only last week. <laughs> <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, someone in the club tapped on the shoulder and said, Mick. <laughs> can, I have a word? Can, I have a quiet, can I have a quiet word in your show, like? <laughs> It's been a couple. It's been a couple of decades, but we we, we have something to tell you. <laughs> want to rush it? Uh, but uh, you mean I? You mean I? So um, well, it was uh, when I, I uh, oh well, I tell you now the story about that. That when the penny finally dropped, as my math teacher said to me once, as the penny finally dropped, lad, as the penny finally dropped, <laughs> um, I invited. I met Kevin Burke, who who was in the when I first started playing. I met up with Kevin Burke. He was fantastic. Any tune I wanted, Kevin came round to the house and got me into a Cayley band that we played together in the Gouty Moor, the, the Irish dance hall here, that his father was running at the time. And um, any tune I wanted, I said, Kevin, I'd love to learn um, whatever, Pigeon on the Gate. Which, I've heard of the ways. Any tune, Kevin came round and played them for me, one after the other, no problem. I drove the guy up the wall, I would imagine, you know, and, 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 and a lot of other people. <laughs> I'm working on you at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing okay so far. <laughs> I'm doing a great job, but so, but seriously, he was so kind. Um, and and another man that was really helpful to me was um Michael Dwyer, the late Michael Dwyer, brother of Finbars. He any tune, lots of tunes. I said, Michael, I'd love to. Could you come round to the flat and play your tunes? He came round and played a couple of hours for me. Just, and the tune that I played before my reel that um, several people record, a few people recorded, and they called them both Mick O'Connors. The first one I never had a name because. Michael record he recorded it for me, but he didn't say, "Oh, Mick, I'll play. This is a real now." Uh, he didn't say, "This is a real of mine." He just played it, and when I listened to the tape after, I thought, oh, I "Like that tune? That's really lovely tune." Little did I know it was his. Years later, years later, somebody said, "You that he composed that." And I thought, "Well, well I, I knew I loved it. You know the way he played it was really beautiful." Um, so, uh, as I say, Kevin sort of. Uh, was very helpful to me. Uh, another thing that I remembered, uh, came, uh, and there was um, a record, that, one of the first records that uh, 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 of complete el a record of jigs and reels was um, Paddy Canny. It's called All Island Champions. Paddy Canny, P. J. Hayes, who was the father of Martin Hayes, and Pedro Lachlan and Bridie Lafferty on the piano. And when I heard that LP first, I, I couldn't play anything. But I, my friend said, "Look, listen to this LP, mate. You like Irish music? I listened to that. And I listened to it. I thought, what a lovely record. But I mean, how on earth? How would you know one tune from the other? There's so many tunes. 
14 tracks of LP. It was all reels and jigs and a couple of hornpipes. When I then eventually started to play a bit, I thought, where's that LP? I could have, that, my friend gave me, put it back on. I thought, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. I've got to learn every tune on this record. And Paddy Canny just, oh, Paddy Canny and PJs. I mean, it was just such lovely music. I don't know if you've heard that. You probably have heard that. It's on CD and etc. for the vinyl. And, I, and a great thing in those days, Ed, that I forgot to mention, was the vinyl LPs, they were 33 and a third speed. Now, there was a setting 16. So I thought, what's that for? Well, anyway, I put it to 16 and played the vinyl, and it went round, dong, dee, da, ding, dong, dee, dong, 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 dong. It sounded like the Dublin's Barney was playing a bass guitar, but it was perfectly in tune. So I could learn it. It was like somebody, somebody sitting there and saying, die, die, dee, do, do. That's how it goes, mate. Play that now. Da, da. I thought, this is fantastic. So it was like having your own teacher. That was a wonderful thing that just happened. If that had been out of tune when I put it down to 16, I wouldn't have known what to do. I thought, well, I can't learn it at that speed, you know. But um, so, and then tape recorders, sometimes you could put them to half speed. But it, but could, it, would, but it would tune it down, yeah. You know. Yeah, for, you know, nowadays, of course, you've got uh, three little buttons on the screen or whatever, and you can half it. You can put it down really slow, and it doesn't change the pitch anything. Oh, this is fantastic. That is, we'd have had things like that in, in, in my day, you know. Um, when I were young, when I were a young man, you know. <laughs> it's going to turn into a Monty Python sketch. I, I must stop this. I must. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'll have them. Um, is it Mike Palin after me or something like that? We used to drink tea out of a rolled up sock. <laughs> exactly. But we were. We were poor, but we were we were we were happy that we were poor. <laughs> <laughs> right, the young people of that today, they won't believe it. Won't we, believe we, it. we we were happy even though we played the banjo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, but uh, so and I was going to say so uh, eventually as I said, oh yeah, just in that little story about um, as uh, I met a few musicians in London. Um, Maura Conley, who was a great fiddle player from uh, County. County Offaly, I think it is. I haven't met that girl in 40 or 50 years. But she, we met in London. She was living in London. She came around to play a few tunes at the flat for me. And um, I had a couple of tunes. I think I had this. this Sky, Paddy's Gone to France, a Skylark from a Dubliner's LP, and some other tune. And so I got her to play Paddy, the Skylark. And, she, and then I said, Maura, I've got another tune. I think it's the high rail. Could, could you tune the fiddle down a bit to play? The, she said, tune the fiddle down. So she tuned the fiddle down, and then we played that tune. This was because I was using the guitar tune that on the, my five-string banjo. I had four strings tuned like the guitar. And so she eventually said, I shouldn't have to tune up and down. I should, really, I said, oh, no, I shouldn't be, I should just, I shouldn't have to do this. But anyway, you need a, you need a four-string banjo is what you need. So the penny dropped, and then um, that was it. That's <laughs> just... So there was literally no other banjo player around that you could well always look at her as reference. Well, it was a great friend of mine, Billy Page, who sold me that banjo, and he, uh, I, I, when the Seven Drunken Knights came out, uh, he, I, he, he sold it to you so he could buy a four string. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never learned. No, but I knew it was a five string. But it's just, I just thought, well, maybe I'll be able to do this, you know, trying to do a cheapskate version of it. And eventually, I thought, no, no, that, you know, then the more. Imp- she the penny dropped, so I said, "Get a tenor banjo." And my first tenor banjo was another Windsor. It was a Windsor Popular Three, Popular Three, I think it was called. It was the most basic. Uh, it was a Clifford Essex, Clifford Essex Popular, Clifford Essex Popular Three. That was it. But it was so basic. There was about five. You know, most banjos you'll have. I don't know how many brackets you'll have. About thirty brackets to tie on the the toe ring that the banjo had. This had about eight. Or set ten, you know, and I thought it looked a bit cheap. And it's calfskin, calfskin, yeah, traditional, not plastic, uh, and it wasn't a great sound at all. And it didn't inspire you, but I tried my best. Then eventually, not long after, um, a friend of mine said, "Mick, I've seen a nice banjo for sale in Kilburn, Kilburn, and it looks like Barney McKenna's." You're joking. Scrambled down there, and it turned out to be in the window was a Clifford Essex Concert Grand. Now, that's the one that Brian McGraw played for a long time. It still plays it, I think. 
Clifford Essex comes to ground, lovely banjo. I, just, I knew it looked, didn't like that, looked like the Paragon, quite like the Paragon uh, that Barney has. So I bought that. Do you know that was, I put 10 bob, 10 shillings down to get that banjo. 50 pence. I said, can I put a deposit on it? <laughs> so I did. And then I went back a few days later and bought it. And maybe a year or two after that, uh, a, a Paragon banjo. Clifford Essex Paragon, like Barney's, came up for sale. And I bought that in a, from a house, somebody in uh, North North London. Evan, so, so was, you know, e even in the context of the money of that time, was it an expensive buy? It certainly was. In fact, I was so nervous buying that banjo, the, 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 the Paragon, that I, it was all my savings, my life savings, you know, 25 pence, you know. But uh, no, um, it was all my entire life sick. <laughs> It was my life saying, and, 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 and nothing has changed, Mick, because we're banjo players. <laughs> exactly, it's that nothing has changed, and all my pets, by any money I'd been given, presents, anything, confirmation money or whatever, you know, it was all there, and I, I saw it advertised. It was advertised as something like uh, it was one hundred and twenty pounds or O N O or near or nearest offer. It's coming up to Christmas, and I remember going up to the house and saying to the guy, "I'd love to buy, it, but I, I couldn't possibly pay any more than a hundred and he. His face sort of lit up a bit, you know. And I thought I made a slip up there. I should have said, I can't pay any more than 80. Anybody. Anyway, and uh, you know, business, business, business. But uh, I thought, I'm going to have to buy this and take a chance. And coming home, I was thinking, what happens if the next warped? It's You get home and well, somebody says to you later, that, that that's not really wrong with that banjo. It's, I took the chance, but and, uh, it, it worked out, you know. So uh, the rest is hysterical. I mean, the rest is history, really, you know. <laughs> Uh, but serious, serious appreciation on, on that on that instrument over the years. Oh God, exactly. I've, I've, I've completely worn it out because I kept playing it. I've kept, and uh, how many? Can you remember how many banjos you've used now since you started? What you say? You know, not not very many. So not, yeah, my first proper banjo was a Maybell. Oh yeah, lovely banjo. Yeah. And then when I was eleven years old, you can just see it here on the wall. And this one, yes. uh, that's an Epiphone recording A. Oh, that's... That was my second banjo. Oh, yeah. And then, like many years later, ten ten years after that, that was my epi or my clarion elite. Oh, yes, that's when uh, I've had, and I've a few more since then. But you know, for that first kind of twenty years, I I played the Epiphone. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, say out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the first time uh, and I met up with yourself was um, that I can remember was I saw you talking to Jerry O'Connor at the back of the gig rig. And I think, I'm trying to think, was it Clonmel or? or that, where? That, that was the first time I ever met Jerry. Are you serious? Yeah. We're, you were chatting to him at the back of the gig rig and I spotted the two of you and I thought, oh no, that's, I didn't know it was you, I saw Jerry. So I went, hello Jerry, and I think he then said, oh, do you know Ender? Well, I didn't know you, so, and then I probably did the joke about, oh, the three tenors, you know. And, um, you know, I got that joke out of the way. Um, but, <laughs> But, and which one's Pavarotti? I don't know. I, I didn't recognize. But anyway, um, but that was a lovely. I wonder what year that was, Jeff. And uh, it's hard to remember, isn't it? I'd say it's probably nineteen or twenty years ago, Mick. Yeah, exactly. yeah. God, the years just go by, don't they? And they're rarely, you know. And but it's um, it's a it's a wonderful thing. I I I I've got a I've got a Gibson. TB3, a Gibson Master at home, but I hardly, I don't play it that much. Did, did you ever have a Gibson? A, a man in Kent, Ohio, a yeah. long, long time ago, gave me, he came up after a show and he yeah. gave me, or he told me that he had his father's old Gibson TB1 banjo. Yeah. And he, yeah. he had all these instruments that, that he had inherited after his father had passed. And he had tried to give away this tenor banjo on a number of occasions. Yeah. yeah. And, and no one would take it. So he what? said, would you like it? And I was like, yeah. sure. And then, of course, got all suspicious and got back to the hotel and took it apart in case it was full of drugs or... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it wasn't. He was a very nice man called Bill Bill Bodnar in uh -huh. Kent, Kent, Ohio. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I, I had that for, for... I never really played it very much. Um, but I eventually, I, I sold it on to fund the neck for the banjo that I bought. Uh, oh, wow, yeah. About four years ago or five years ago. Wow! So that was a that was a Gibson TB one. Mm -hmm. 
Was that was that an old one as well? Would you say? Uh it would have been old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't a master tone. I've never played a, a master tone. A yeah, tenor. A very nice slim neck on them. Very, very nice. Very sought after. I think maybe a lot of the bluegrass players love them. So some of them, would, if they bought tenor more, they would take the, the neck off it and put a five string neck onto the pot, and you know, because they're really good, solid sound. That very heavy tone ring. That the one a similar tone ring that's in the one that Barney McKenna's Paragon, which somebody put in many years back, you know, um, that, that very solid. I think the your the the, 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 the the Tom's banjos, the clarines are heavy, and Dave Boyles, they're heavy, aren't they? They're they're very solid, heavy made, and very strong and good. Uh, yeah, the newer ones are a little bit lighter because they're using different materials. But going back in the day when they had the solid, the full flange, that was like, they were really heavy banjos. And the Dave Boyle ones seemed to be even heavier. But great sounds, yeah. Great sound, great, wonderful sounds off them, that's right. Um, yeah. The, uh, where, is Barney, where, where is Barney McKenna's banjo? Now I'm trying to think now. Uh, God, you caught me there. I've just got a blank. I've just got a blank where that might, because that was a wonderful, but that was a banjo. So I mean, that was the banjo that Barney played on the Ed Sullivan show. When when the Dubliners won the Ed Sullivan show, um, they were going to do Seven Junker Nights because they had that big hit record. But I think he didn't want them to do that. So they did, uh, I think it was Kelly the Boy from Kalan or Whiskey in the Jar. But that, that's the banjo. Barney's playing that lovely paragon. And that was, well, 67 was Drunken Nights, Seven Drunken Nights. Now, the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show. 63 and 64, wasn't it? 64. 64 was that massive time. 73 million people watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. 64. So, so that's only three years later the Dubliners were on, on, the, on that show. You know, it's when, because that was, a, that was a massive hit. You know, the England and Ireland, the Seven Drunken Nights is a really big thing. And it was when I heard that, that clip of that, at the end of the record, when you hear the banjo, the fiddle, guitar, the, the whistle, I just thought, oh, what a beautiful combination. That really is something. I'm going to give up trying to sing, which was very good news to all my friends and neighbours, and um, and, uh, and and try and, you know, annoy them with a banjo. <laughs> it was amazing. I used to be practising that my banjo at home in the front room, which was also the back room, and, you know, the neighbours, they broke all the windows in my flat so they could hear me better. It was a fantastic thing. I don't know. <laughs> and that's an old joke that I, that I took from uh, Paddy Fallon. Paddy Fallon, the 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 Kyoto's embassy. I, I use that. So, uh, make, growing up in London and in, in Kilburn, like we we look back now at the sixties and the seventies, and they call it the folk revival. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That it was such an important era for for Irish music and for folk music. Did you oh, ever yeah. know? Like, what was your awareness of that as you were living in it and living through it and part of it? Well, it, well, it's it fantastic to think I was there, I was there for, you know, because it started in the 60s. Like, as you said, uh, the uh, the folk revival, I got to listen to at school, Bob Dylan and Joan Byers. We had a little folk folk club thing when I was in the six, six, 17, 17, around those years. Yeah, 67, 66 is it, the folk club. And some of our teachers brought in a Joan Byers album or a Bob Dylan album. I thought, this is lovely. And then a friend of mine about uh, when I, I got my first banjo in 69 was my first banjo, 68 in minute. But I heard about a folk club called the the, Foot, the Holy Ground. And it was in it was in Bayswater in London, what near the central London, where I am just here. And um, it was in the crypt of a church. And what I, th I just thought about it today, earlier before I spoke to you, because um, I found a note that somebody told me, Shay Healy, um, they said, a friend of mine said to me a couple months or two ago, Mick, Go to YouTube and listen to Shirley Healy singing When We Are Stardust, I think it's called. Have you ever heard of Shay Healy at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's famous. Um, well, I saw it, Shay in that folk club one night because we used to go every Wednesday, I think it was. We'd go every Wednesday and it was wonderful people. Paul Brady and Mick Maloney were there with the Johnsons as the Johnsons band. That was fantastic. Martin Carthy and Dave Swarbrick. Uh, Hamish Imlach, who... Um, I think, you know, that lovely song, um, Black is the Colour. Black is the Colour. I'm not certain. I, I, I don't know. I don't think he wrote it, but he was the one that I heard him. I'm sure I heard him sing that. And Jim McCann came over, folks doing a solo thing. Fantastic. Of course, later to join up with the doublers. 
Noel Murphy, who I got to play with the singer, uh, passed away there recently, and Davy Johnston, the banjo player, who Davy then, about three years after I seen him, joined up with Elton John as um, Elton John's lead guitar player. And he's still the musical director. I knew Davy as a banjo player. I, 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 I have a friend in, that lives in Malibu, in California, whose best friend is Davy Johnson. There you go. I'll, I'll have the, <laughs> the small world of me. Small world. Well, it's many. It's, well, when I heard Davy playing the banjo, because I was really enamored with um, Barney's playing, but when I saw Davy playing with Noel Murphy, Davy with his long hair, young guy, very young, playing the banjo, my age, or just a bit older than me. And there he was, and he put the banjo behind his head, playing like Jimi Hendrix. And then he'd, and then he'd, he'd do a banjo solo in the first half. I remember one night going to see him, he did a banjo solo in the first half, and it got a standing ovation. Everybody, including me, we all stood up, and I've hardly ever seen that. Now, in the second half, he borrowed Noel's guitar, and he did a blues on the guitar. That got a standing ovation. And I thought, this is incredible. This guy is really something. How, you know, you, that is exceptional to me. It, it, I, I don't remember seeing a, a standing ovation at the end of the gig. Yeah, maybe. But after the badges, it was just it was just a whiz kid, you know. It was just, um, and then, of course, he'd been, well, he'd been living in Beverly Hills, I think, for 50, 45 years or whatever. You, you you didn't get to meet him yourself, but your friends knows him. Yeah. Ah, uh, wonderful. Well, he's a wonderful musician, Davy. Um, and I think that Elton John's doing his farewell tour at the moment, so Davy will be out with him around America or around the world, I suppose. But it's it was so I was I just thought how, how can that how can he play so well at, at a young age like Barney was that a little bit older, but um, it was a, but he inspired me. So I thought, and I remember Kevin Burke and myself. Uh, talking about David one night and uh, Kevin played me this wonderful recording of Davey playing and we couldn't get over it we thought it was the best thing we'd ever heard Rakers Paddy um, uh, the the flowers of Edinburgh the flowers of Edinburgh and Rakers Paddy and the way Davey played it was just really quite exceptional in an amazing way he had to play the banjo are there are there recordings of him playing banjo yeah, yeah, I've got one. I've got one with with um, with um, Noel. That's an LP called a vinyl LP called Another Round. And Davy plays those tunes on it. Uh, Another Round. That was the name of the um, of the of the vinyl LP at the time. Oh, it might be still on the record. But Davy played other things. Uh, you know, uh, there was probably a few other things he did. Um, so that, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? The, the people that influence you, you know, over the years. You, you and, and I forgot to mention things um, in the like. Um, before the, I, I played, you'd have the, you know, the Beverly Hill Billings, that series would be on the television, and you'd yep. hear Flat and Scrubs playing that music, the same music. Come listen to my story about a man named Jed. And then, what was that film, Enda? Uh, um, Body and Clyde, with the five string banjo, Scrubs again. Yep. Oogie Mountain Breakdown, Flat and Scrubs. I thought when I heard that, what a lovely sound that is, the banjo. Um, and that was five string, of course, but you know, um, I don't think so, um, there's a ba ba Bela, Bela, Bela Fleck credits here in the Beverly Hillbillies for his interest in banjo. I think that, I think they did a lot for us, really. And um, I remember, no, Ender, did you ever go to? Um, I wish I'd only seen Flat and Scrubs, you know. But I, I, did you ever go to Ender the the Johnny Keenan, uh, the Keenan uh, Festival? It was in um, where was it? First of all, it was in Longford for a number of Long years, many Longford. years. That that was when it was. At its peak, yeah, it was fantastic. What a shame I never went to it. No, d did you go? <laughs> Do you know how I ended up there? Now, me, me and Chris are are the best of buddies for oh, many, many years. But oh. I, I, it was like way back in like the year two thousand, I'd say, yeah. maybe, maybe even before. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I went into, I, I'd go into Easons, the book, the bookstore in Galway, to just to, to read Irish music magazine rather than buying it, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, and, so, I, and so I, I saw an ad for the Johnny Keenan Banjo Festival, and there was a phone number on the ad. Oh yes. And so I rang up the phone number, <laughs> and in all my early twenties bravado, I said, uh, "Why am I on this listing for the, <laughs> for the Banjo Festival?" Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And it was Chris herself, and she goes, "Who are you?" Yeah. And uh, I said, "Enda Scal." Um, and anyway, out of that, I I I inveigled. And this is the funny thing, Mick. Uh, I, I I managed to get a slot playing uh, in the hotel across the road from where the main concert was on. Oh yeah, yeah. So Chris said, "Yeah, you can ha you can have a gig in the in the hotel, right?" Yeah, 
Yeah. But and I said, that's fine. I'll do it for nothing. But I want ten minutes on the main stage. Myself and my brother will will jump up in between acts as they're switching over. And so she, she agreed to that. So we went yeah. over. Now, this was before I really knew anything about bluegrass music. Yeah. So the crazy part of the story is we were playing in the hotel, ran across the road, jumped up on stage, did 10 minutes of like just blistering trad, got a stand ovation, ran out the door, went back over to our pub. And eventually in the bar, and I didn't know this until way after, Earl Scruggs and his entire band came in and watched our show. Are you serious? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Doctor? Oh, how about that? Oh, that is good, isn't it? When yes. something like that happens, you know. So that was, you say, the 2000 or a bit before that, maybe. Yeah, I think maybe, yeah, I'd say probably 2000, I'd say years. Yeah. Something around, so he, around that time. So I suppose there would be lots of, you know, he probably came up, they, they probably came over a few times, I suppose. And then you'd have Bella Fleck playing there and God, lots of. I wonder if Ricky Skaggs would have ever come up. No, he, well, he, he plays, well, he does play the mandolin, doesn't he? Of course he does. She does. I don't know that Ricky ever do it, but she had, she had the, the, like the best of the best oh, God, that played. It was incredible. I wish I'd only, uh, I wish I'd, I meant to go, but I'd never got around to going to that. That you was all right. You, sh you should have rang her up and just demanded a gig like I did. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the way to do it. Oh, no, that's. Do you not know who I think I am? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's Mick, did you get formal instruction, or did you just start? Did you just start picking? I didn't really know. I the, the only thing I did remember was the first. I remember asking my friend Bill Page, "Where would you start playing the Seven Drunken Nights song?" And he showed me. You start it on whatever fret it was, you know, and that was it. After that, I didn't. I probably didn't realize about lessons at that time. Um, no, I don't think that, I probably never heard that there were lessons, and if I did. I didn't go to them. But again, you see, I met so, uh, having, you know, got 67, I went to see the Dubliners play at the Albert Hall in London. And afterwards, I went to the stage door and Barney came out eventually. And um, he, he, he talked to me like he knew me. And then, then the next day, I got to know them. And then we'd go to every concert that they did in London and go to a session after. They, you know, we they, instead of them going home and having a rest or whatever because they had to play the next day, they'd come to a session with us or go or we'd go to a session that they knew about, you know, Luke and Ronnie and Barney and John. And it was just fantastic. And so there'd be more music, more practice. And then, of course, I'm, uh, I got to meet up with the musicians in London. There were all these wealth of fantastic musicians that were playing in London. Now, this famous pub called The Favourite on the Holloway Road which was a, a Sunday afternoon session. Jimmy Power led it with Reg Hall and um, Paddy Malone. I think Paddy Malone on the Gordon. There was also another man called Tony Ledwitz. But everybody would go there. Roger Sherlock, Bobby Casey, Tommy McCarthy. Um, you, you, you name it. Um, musicians would, would all be there. And so you'd learn more tunes and then you'd probably go somewhere, somebody's house maybe, for a few tunes after. Saturday night. There must be, you must have wild stories from nights out with the, the Dubliners and the Bobby Casey's of the world. Like these are all legends of Irish music. And I, I, well, there were so, so many fantastic. What, one night I, I was asked when I was only playing about a year or two, simply one or two, I, I was playing with two Dublin men uh, in a band and we were asked to back uh, Dominic Behan, Brendan's brother. And so that was an experience. I think that was in the club that was being run by you and McCollum Peggy Singer, but they weren't there that night. So that was an experience. Back in the legendary Dominic Bean, who wrote all these wonderful songs, uh, Crooked Jack, McAlpine's Fuse and Leers, I think. Yeah, wrote all those. Uh, um, the Patriot Game, lots of lo 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 lots of songs, you know. I suppose at the time you don't, like you were saying about the folk revival, Ewan uh, McCall, all those wonderful songs that he wrote. Uh, and the only time I got to see him was when there was a, a tribute to him. That's right, there was a tribute to him at the Festival Hall. And he was there with Peggy Steger. And uh, and um, I remember my friend Paddy Gallo, who was one of my best friends who played the guitar, sadly died a couple of years ago. We used to play quite a lot together. He was there with the McCarthy family, Bobby Casey. And, and it was just it was just fantastic that, to see you and McCall, who wrote The Travelling People. The um, all, the shoals of herring, you know, all these fantastic songs, all these wonderful songs. Which I I don't know how long they'd been composed before Luke Kelly and the early Dubliners 
started seeing them. So we were hearing them, you know, and not realising that they hadn't got been written. They hadn't been long written. So they were very fresh, you know, just a wonderful. That was that was fantastic to be part of that. And um, then trying to get into a folk group, folk, little folk group myself and doing Clancy Brothers stuff. The Clancy Brothers were fantastic as well. We loved them, all those lovely songs. I used to try and sing them. I didn't sing them. I murdered them, really. I didn't. I couldn't sing uh, But eventually then, when we heard the drums, I thought, oh, I'd better go on the banjo and quit while I, I think I'd better quit while I'm behind, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that was it. And, and, and then, of course, these wonderful people, Tom McCarthy in particular, was like an art. He was like a part, I was like part of his family. Um, and he would bring me to sessions that he was playing at with Tom, with uh, Bobby Casey, Roger Sherlock, John Bow, Michael Dwyer. Oh, it was Finbar Dwyer. I mean, there was it, 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 these are legends. I was just so fortunate to be, uh, you know, starting to play and play music at that time. Well, they were all in London. If you if you wanted to go to Ireland to hear those people, you'd have to go to Sligo to hear Roger. If he was living there, you know, you'd have to go to Donegal then to, to meet Johnny Doherty and all, and then you'd have to go down to Cork to meet Finbar Dwyer. But these people, they would come to London. You could hear them. Like tonight, Monday night we'll go. Uh, where we go Monday? Tuesday we'll go to the Celtics, and Michael Dwyer will possibly be there, and Roger and Bob. Wednesday we'll go to another session. It was really tailor made for you. It was just we didn't know how lucky we were. Really, I don't think. No. Uh, was was there money in London? Is that why the musicians were there? Yes, they came over to that's right. They came over to find work, and and you know, uh, and um, and of course sometimes there'd be whole gangs of them working away. Um, uh, you can imagine the crack would be good. We'd be whistling tunes, which, <laughs> and uh, and I can imagine that sort of thing. Because um, I, I well, I did go. I did, I did do some when I just before I left school. I went with my dad because my dad was a plasterer, and I went out a few times with him to uh, to the building site. You know, could get gathered up a few bits of wood and got my first wage packet. I remember from the the foreman that ten bob. There was a ten shilling note in this wage packet. I thought, what's this? Oh, five to, I was just gathering up, making tea for the lads, you know. What's this one opened it up? A ten bob note, fifty pence? Oh, that's a fortune, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> funny, isn't it? Before decimalization, you know. So decimalization didn't come until nineteen seventy one. So we had all these pounds, shillings and pence before that, you know. So a nightmare. <laughs> so what did you do for work, Mick? Was it was it all music? Well, after after fifty years and uh, of doing music, I've decided now it's time for me to take a, a well-earned uh, a job. <laughs> now, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I still don't. I thought, what am I going to do when I live? So I can't do music. This is impossible. I can't do music. And so the next thing is, I, I was only playing a couple of years when Johnny Minogue, my great friend, the late Johnny Minogue from County Clare, he asked me to join the, the Gelty Moore Cayley Band. And that was every Saturday, Sunday night in the dance hall, packed with Irish people. Siege of Venice and all time waltzes. And then I would meet all these wonderful people. I, I was great musicians in the band. Uh, Martin Tracy, some of the people I can remember, Martin Tracy from, from very near Paddy Fahey's area in, in, in uh, Ockram there, down, down in, in not too far from you. And um, uh, Steve O'Loughlin, a great flute player from County Clare, neighbour of Peter O'Loughlin's. And all these other musicians, and my other friends then, uh, Frank Tighe, who was a relate? Uh, he played in the band with Brendan McGlinchey before he came to London, and he would tell me stories about the great days with Johnny Pickering, Brendan McGlinchey, Sean McGuire, all these people that when he remembers playing with them, and that was just um, so interesting to hear lovely stories about. Uh, I think he told me one night Jackie Hurst played with it, the Jackie Hurst trio. Jackie, I never met. He was a wonderful, I think, three row. Button Gordon player told me one night there were three of them, the Jackie and two more. One night, one of them didn't make it, so they they, they were announced as the Jackie Hurst two o. <laughs> now it was stuck in my head where he described that, ladies and gentlemen, the Jackie Hurst two o. So, but God, if I could think of all the stories, and uh, you know, um, this first wish in Irish music, isn't it? Or maybe Irish oh, people. Oh God, is that, that that certainly is. Oh yes. And what was it? The one I heard, Ender. Um. Well, there's one that I got from John Bow. He said, you three, there was 
you, you, when you meet th there's three people in front of you, you wait till they they and and then you get ready to say this one. You you look at them, and you go, "You three are a fine pair, if ever I saw." And it's it's not bad, is it? But I I remember that I keep that ready to use. <laughs> I want I've got many friends, you know. But anyway, um, no, uh, but you know. The wit, you know, um, you can hear some some great some great lines. I think the one, what was the one I was said? Somebody told me and I'm I'm using that a lot recently. When somebody says, "Do I tell you what, Ender? It's a small world, but I wouldn't like to have to paint it." <laughs> so, you know, it's it's. Um, I think you told me one. You told me one when when we were speaking last week, but I can't remember what it was now. I can't either, but I have a funny feeling it was kind of inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh. Egged on by you, I'm going to say. Yeah, exactly. Egged on by. <laughs> so you well, built in the Gal you played in the Galaxy Moor. Was that for a long time? Did you travel very much with that then? Uh, well, I we played from the, with them from about seventy one or two till about eighty five or six, and we, we were fortunate. Yeah, we were we were very fortunate. Uh, Mick Whelan, late Mick Whelan, who uh, ran a dance hall called the Forum in London, he we 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 decided to enter for the Thatch for the All Island as the Thatch Cady Band. Mick ran a, a, a hall in near Highbury Islington called the Thatch, and they they started up uh, about about six of them playing on a Sunday afternoon. Wonderful! And John Carty was with them, and um, John did the, the the London fly. You had to go in for the London fly and qualify, uh, be first or second or third, I think, and then you go to the old Brit. So John was with them for the all the London fly to qualify. They won that. So, but then John got on a building scheme where he, John was a carpenter. Uh, and uh, he was working with some friends uh, and they're all different trades and they were going to build a house they built houses and they were given hours to do their allotted uh, t time you know with their skills plumbers painters roofers whatever so John said well I, I'm going to have to pull out now because I, I, I've got them on this building scheme so they, I was asked and I was so fortunate because um, we then went in for, to the old Britain and we fortunate we went through to the old island and we went to the Old Island, which was 1986, in Listowel, I think. And well, to my joy, we we won, and it was it was so exciting and to to win that. You know, I can't can't tell you. I was there. I wasn't at oh. the Cayley, I wasn't at the Cayley Band competition because I was only ten years old. Oh but, wow! But I played in that. I played at that flat in wow. Listowel. Yeah. Oh, amazing! God, wonderful memories, isn't it? And then we went to, the next year. Went to 87. We went to, well, I can't remember if it was a store or Clonmel. It might have been, anyway, we were fortunate to win a game there. And then we tried again. We were trying for three in a row there. The, and then we, that didn't happen. That was, um, that was where, Glon, I think that was Clonmel. And we were beaten, I think, by the, um, by the Kilfenora, by the Kilfenora, uh, Kelly Band. And they won three in a row then, I think. That was first of three in a row then. But so it's what, it's a pity they didn't go and turn it into some kind of a career after winning three in a row, the Kilfenora. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was so, you know, it's amazing. It's the different bands, quite a number of bands, haven't they, over the years have won three in a row. Later years, the to the Toyn. Uh, oh, no, there's several. No, I can't bring to mind now. The Paddy O'Brien's, I think, Paddy O'Brien from, from Tipperary, Paddy O'Brien from Nina. He, his, I think he got, his band, the Ormond, got three in a row and some years later got another three. Um, but competitions, you know, I always find them really nerve-wracking. But they have their, you know, they're good because they bring people together, they're practicing, you might say, oh, no, we don't get too excited or worried if you win or you, you don't win. But they bring people together, you get together with your friends and you're practicing and there's more music. So it's all good. It's all good. Was, was, it, was it well celebrated then in, in, in London when the, like, a London Cayley band goes over and wins the All-Ireland? Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's still a big deal. Yeah, well... <laughs> I, I, I remember coming back to the Galtimore Moor the following weekend, and I really think I was thinking to myself, "This is a most wonderful thing, is it?" To tell the boys, "Yeah, we won," you know, and um, it really it was thrilling. I must admit that was thrilling. And then we, we made a cassette. Then. We made a cassette. It was cassette in those days, uh, and that was called the Legacy. And that was a wonderful experience doing that down in a studio in um, Fulham, Fulham Broadway, uh, near to the near to the famous White Hart Pub, which was which was where I cut my eye teeth. That was one of the first places in London my friend Bill Page took me to. He said, you like the banjo? You're right. Okay, let's go down to the White Hart Pub for Broadway, which is only about five miles from where I live. And we'll hear Raymond Rowland, God rest him from Loch Ray. Well, no, Raymond was from Kilcreesht. 
in uh, in in uh, you know not too far from Joe Cooley's area and Kevin uh, Kieran Collins and Liam Farrell on the banjo from Tyrone from Valley Door and Mick Sheridan on the guitar. And when I heard them, I thought, oh, this is the place. I'm coming back here. I mean, it's every Thursday night. And not long later, I was asked to come in and play myself on some of the nights regularly, you know, with Raymond. Raymond, John, John, John Bow, Roger, Roger Sherman, John Bow. And then some nights the Dubliners might be in town. They'd come in. The session would go on after. The crack would be deadly. It, 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 really fantastic, you know. Um, uh, God, some of the people that came in, you know, it was just wonderful. Well, I was talking to Shamey O'Dowd. Rory Gallagher used to live in Fulham. And Rory went into the pub. He told John Bow that he he went to, he used to hear John in there. I didn't realise that. I never saw R- Rory in there. Maybe, I hope he was there. It, I probably wouldn't have known him because I loved Rory Gallagher's uh, music. Um, but it's funny, isn't it, the way things go? You know, sometimes you don't know somebody really. You're in a, you're playing in a place like, like you with the... Um, the, the old Scruggs and all the boys, you know, <laughs> and having no idea. <laughs> Wonderful thing. What's that? What's that? Um, the one about the, the Deliverance film? Uh, somebody sent it to me as I think. Paddle faster. I hear banjos. <laughs> <laughs> Paddle faster. I hear banjo. Uh, what about Steve Martin? Of course, Steve Martin with the five string banjo. He's a great player. I, I never met Steve. We we did a festival a number of years ago in North Carolina, and he plays with a band from Asheville in North Carolina, uh, oh. steep, the Steep Canyon Rangers. And we we were on the two main stages at the same time. And oh. uh, by the time we got off, he was gone because we did we did run over to see could we could we could we catch him afterwards. But I mean, he's such a huge celebrity by all accounts, a really really nice guy. But oh, yes. he hightails it after the shows. Which is understandable too, you know. Exactly. I I remember in the, when I went on holiday to America in seventy uh, six was it seventy six? That was it exactly. Yeah, it was definitely that year. Seventy five. I was fortunate to go on a Kilter's tour to America, and that was so wonderful to meet all those um, wonderful musicians in uh, in uh, New York and Philadelphia, and you know so many people. I was for- fortunate to meet Paddy Reynolds and Andy McGann. Johnny Crone and, and uh, Seamus Connolly. And, well, well, you know, this was endless, you know, really. Sean McGlynn, uh, Jody, uh, Jody Madden's uh, father. Uh, I mean, so it was just wonderful that I was, went out that early, fairly early days for it. I think I, I'm trying to think Paddy Glacken was with us and Joe Burke, and we had wonderful times with them uh, and, and a good few others. But um, I must admit, that was just an experience. The first night I, I landed in America, that night, uh, we stayed in, we were in New York, and the phone rang, and it was Joe Burke reading the house. I was, I was staying with um, Tony Smith, Anton McGowan, their brother, in Long Island, and the phone rang, and it was, they said, Mick, there's a phone call for you. So I said, who could be phoning me? I've only, I've only just, who'd want to phone me? I've just, just come to America. I've never been. But it was um, Paddy Glacken said, Mick, we're going for a tune down the... I said, Paddy, it's half past ten. He said... Well, we're we're going, you know. Joe Burke's coming, so I so I said to Huey, they want, they're going for a few tunes. I, it's a bit late. He said, he said, would you like to go? I said, I'd love to go. So we did. Four o'clock in the morning, we left that pub. And the thing is about that is, when you're young, you can do these sort of things. We'd left Shannon. The, 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 New York is five hours five hours behind, five hours behind or whatever it was. So that meant it was like. We came home at 10 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock. But it was, you're, you're full of adrenaline and you're so, it was such a wonderful night of music at the crack was really, I thought, what a, cool, I came to America like Eddie Murphy coming to America and here I am. What an introduction that was. Andy McGann came in that night. Oh, what a, well, we're blessed, you know, with all this wonderful you, music. You, you, you've met them all, Mick. Is, is there anybody that you'd love to play a tune with that you haven't? Uh, the, 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 um, you mean the, the ones that are alive now? That are, uh, well, alive, alive or dead? But let's 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 go with the alive ones for starters. Yeah, and... yeah. I'm just trying to think now. Uh, there's probably a whole load that I can't think of. They are them because um, oh dear. Well, do you know uh, what? what uh, there's a banjo playing Kevin Griffin down in Doolan. I've never met Kevin. Do you know Kevin? I've never met Kevin, but I had his first album when I was a young lad. Oh yeah, I've never met Kevin because we're banjo players. I must try and meet Kevin. Um, 
and there's oh God, I'm sure there's so many more that I can't think of just bring to mind just at the moment. But um, God, uh, but you know, you just you, you just think uh, when you get the chance to go to Ireland again, you say, right, ah, oh, no, this because you know you get a, you make a list and think, oh, wouldn't it be lovely to meet him, her? Um, I was fortunate and over the years to meet so many people like. Uh, I had one session, you know, Sean Ryan that composed, Sean Ryan, the fiddle player, that composed, um... Glenn of Arlo. Read the Glenn of Arlo, one of my favourite tunes. One of my friends said to me, Mickey said, if I could compose a tune like the Glens of Arlo, I'd die happy. I said, oh, that's interesting. I always remember him saying that to me 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever. What a great tune. That is, and you played that not, not that long ago, didn't you? You went to it did. Fantastic tune, isn't it? The Glens of Arlo. Um... When, when it was on that record, the Paddy Canny, P.J. Hayes record, they called it Lafferty's Reel. Because obviously, Bridie played the piano. They probably thought, oh, we haven't got a name for that. We can't stick Gunanam on again. Let's put it, oh, Bridie, we'll call that after you. I assume that's what they did. Fantastic uh, tune. Because um, Fr Frankie, Frankie Gavin and Paul Barker recorded it, and they called it with Charlie Lennon, and they called it Lafferty's as well. It, did they really? Ah. Uh, yeah. Really. Well, I was fortunate to meet Paddy. Oh, I think I'm so uh, fortunate and so blessed that I had one lovely afternoon of music with with uh, Sean Ryan, uh, Johnny Doherty, one one seventy five, I think it was seventy six. I said to my friend, well, I'd love to meet this man called Johnny Doherty in Donny's Ball. He said, right, well, listen, we'll take a trip out there. Found out Danny Meehan, I think, told me where he was living, and uh, when I got, we drove up to uh, Carrick near near Killy Banks, a whole afternoon and an evening with Johnny Doherty. I mean. It was just not to be forgotten. That was really quite, uh, really something, you know. What a what a wonderful player he was, and God, what a lovely night, and a really nice man, you know. Uh, did you ever did you ever meet anyone that didn't like the banjo? Uh, I'm trying to think. I think yes, I did. I, I'm sure I have done. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't have to name them. <laughs> I can I can think of one or two that I met over the years. Pretty the household names that yeah, that just yeah, don't yeah, like but, it. Yeah, yeah, because the thing is, when I think about it, you know, it's such a strong instrument, you know, that you can't, uh, we can't like every instrument, can we? It, uh, hopefully we try to, try to love them all, you know. Um, so not everybody's going to uh, tell you to your face, I really don't like the banjo, you know. And if that happens, you appreciate that, you know, of course, because we can't like everything. But um, but I do remember going back to Steve Martin, 76 on that holiday. One Saturday night, I remember, we were in San Francisco, name dropping again, and somebody put on, my cousin put on Saturday Night Live. Me, Oh, I said, what's this? Saturday Night Live, you're like this. And all comes Steve Martin with a white suit and a five-string banjo. And I thought, who's this? And he was doing all this comedy. He put a, he had a, an arrow on a metal wire. He put it through his head. He, yeah, I'd like to keep the comedy going, he said, while, I, while I'm playing. And there's his stick. And then, he, and then he did this whole sketch about the banjo. Such an instrument, isn't it? You can't be, you can't be sad with the banjo, can you? I mean, oh, murder and death. It doesn't work, does it? And then he going into this big sketch where he, he started saying, you know, uh, and he started pretending to the cameraman. They said, can we try that, uh, you know, that little, uh, that number we we're going to do earlier? Uh, is it right we do it? But uh, it, it's, no, we can't, we can't do it. Oh, no, no, that's fine. No, we can't do it. Okay, that's fine. No, that's not a problem. That's fine. Let's get, let's move on. It's, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not annoyed. It, it's just like, you know, it's just we we were practicing that, and I, I, you know, I just was hoping that I, the artist, could get a little help from the backstage crew. I'm angry. Oh, would I do? No, I'm not. I'm happy. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, and that was it. And I thought, what a fantastic sketch the way he did it with the banjo. And of course, he's, God, he's wonderful. And that was way before the films and everything that he'd sent. Did you see Brendan Gleeson <clears throat> recently played Chief O'Neill's hornpipe when he was uh, he was he's at hosting or certainly introducing Saturday Night Live? No, oh, I missed that. Then that's fantastic. Yeah, he came out, takes up the mandolin. He refers to the Dubliners. It was kind of lost on the audience that were in the studio. You could see that in 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 in, in one sense, and, and then he played Chief O'Neill's hornpipe. But I just thought it was such a classy thing to do. Lovely. Uh, so I'm just. I'm going to try to make a note of this to remind us of Brendan Gleeson uh, on the, on Saturday Night Live. Mm. Any, any idea how long ago, roughly? Uh, oh, well, not not long ago at all. I'd say within the last uh, three or four months. 
Oh, fantastic. Lovely. So I make a note to try and hear that. The other thing that I didn't want to forget, uh, Brent, uh, and there was, what was the other thing? I, I, you said, well, you'll send me the link for something. Oh, well, yeah, for the, that, yeah, for the, uh, yeah, the uh, Shackleton documentary. Yeah. Oh, no, that, no, that would be, that would be. I should, I should have asked you beforehand so that you could have had an answer prepared for this, but. Yes. Yeah. Feel, feel free to take, to take a minute. Oh, yeah, please, yeah. Dead, dead or alive, it doesn't matter. Your your ideal session, your your dream session. You're after walking in the front door of the Black Line pub in Kilburn. Yeah. Oh, who's yeah. in? Who's sitting there? Ah, oh, no. Well, I suppose. Obviously, we'd love to have imagined that Michael Coleman had come back from from New York and was there. It, it, and uh, and so we'd have to have someone like Joe Burke playing in there, wouldn't we? Really, Joe, the great Joe that's passed away recently. I'm just trying to think. God, there's so many, because if I picked out a few, there'd be all the other 50 that I didn't, that I should have put in there. <laughs> that's all. I mean, if they're if they're not around, they won't be mad at me, so it's okay. Oh, that's true. That's true. And then you've got, oh, God, who else do we think of now? And uh, will it, uh, will it, you know, and, uh, some of the ones that are legendary, Tommy Potts. I heard Tommy, the great, have you heard much music of him? Yeah. I, I was fortunate to be in O'Donoghue's one time in the 70s. And um, I met a neighbour of his who said he'd bring me round to Tommy's house, and we and and he did. We went round, and Tommy played for me for a half an hour in the sitting room, like a con. I came out of there thinking, I don't believe that just happened. That is amazing. He just played for me. And I, the, the the disappointment I had was that I said to Tommy, "Oh, could I have a tune with you?" He said, "Might be. I'll just play a few tunes for you now because really, really, he was busy, you know." And he said, "I'll just play a few tunes because otherwise you're going to be in there for the, the for the duration." And I thought, what a wonderful thing it did for me. It was fantastic, really fantastic music. And you know those beautiful variations and things he could do um, on the record. The what's the record called? The Hapney? Is it called the? What's that bridge? The Hapney Bridge? Mm -hmm. There's there's a, a, a vinyl LP I had. Uh, there's a bridge, the bridge over Dub in Dublin, over the over, um, the Hapney Bridge, and he had the picture of him standing at the one end of it. So that's fantastic. Um, the people, you know. Um, Paddy O'Brien from Tipperary here in Pad and of course how could I forget my great friend Paddy Carty that I made a record with I was on the back to him on an LP in the about 74 who was one of the most outstanding flute players Paddy Carty from that lived in Loch Ray. Um I think he's before your time maybe you wouldn't have met him would you no no well, I was fortunate to meet him and of course Paddy Fahey the legendary Paddy Fahey met him had a session one night with Joe Burke Paddy Fahey and Paddy Carty what more could you ask you know, to be in a, a lovely session in Joe's house in the 70s, that was. I thought, this is really, it's just so wonderful. I just happened to be around and meet them, you know, and to, and they put up with me rather, you know, well, uh, which is very nice. <laughs> but, you know, um, things like that, and there are um, fantastic. Paddy Fahey. Have you, you, you have amazing gratitude for all of the musicians that you met. Have you any regrets? Is there anything that you wish you did? Places that you could have gone and you didn't? Any chances that came along or opportunities? Um, oh, oh God. Well, I, I, I remember that... Um, uh, I'm just trying to think. Well, the places in America that I haven't been to yet, I'd love to... I haven't visited Nashville and Memphis. I'd like to go to Nashville and Memphis. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, they're, they're, they're more, oh, the Rocky Mountain. You've probably been over to Canada, to, uh, to, uh, to those places, those places that sound like uh, Seattle. Vancouver, the Rocky Mountains, Banff, Calgary. Have you been to those places? Uh, not not Calgary and Banff, but Seattle, all over the states. Yeah, Love Vancouver. It. Yeah, though I've got so many, so many places. And then um, and Dan, 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 I haven't been to New Orleans. I mean, you've probably been there. I'm sure. I was there on St. Patrick's Day, the year of Hurricane Katrina. So just a few months beforehand. Oh wow! And we stayed down in the Latin Quarter, which would have been. We stayed with a couple of uh, some Irish uh, billionaires that had a house down there and organised a concert in the Irish pub in wow. uh, in 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 Nolans, as they call it. Oh, it was, it was a really cool experience. So well, that must have been something. I I um I, I, there was some there was some uh, there was a couple of bluegrass musicians I met in about seventy eight nine eighty eighty one whatever that in London a, a five string banjo player and a guitar player. And they're from Kentucky, and I've lost contact with them completely. But I'm hoping that I could try and renew that acquaintanceship with them. I uh, hope they're alive and well. 
much younger than me, and they were really outstanding. They their heroes were, I think one of them was called. I'm just trying to think. Was his name Paul Hill? But they were they were from a place called Gun Branch, in Kentucky, and I I'm not certain what a bigger town is that is related to that. But their heroes they were telling me were the Stanley Brothers, and I'd never heard of the Stanley Brothers at the time. But I have since after that, and they really were wonderful. Five string banjo and guitar. And they sang in harmony. Uh, Rocky Top was one of the songs I really loved that they were doing. Have you heard that song? Good old Rocky Top, Rocky Top, Tennessee. Oh, that was it was really quite something to hear them do that. It really took off when they sang, and the and uh, the guitar player uh, I think was one was Mike Momsport, and the guitar he was playing a Guild guitar, and the, with the mahogany front, a be- an exceptionally beautiful sound of that guitar. And it just really, it really, the bass sound of it really adds to the treble sound of the of the of the, of the five string ringing out. Um, so it's lovely, isn't it? The old timey music and the bluegrass. I do green grass myself. That's what I play, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I try to. <laughs> That's the play, but smoke or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's what's next? What's next for for Mick O'Connor? What's next, Mick O'Connor? Well, I, I probably the next time I see you, Ed, I'll, it'll be to apologise for this bit. I would imagine. <laughs> I would imagine, you know, when we get when the complaints start coming through. But uh, no, uh, well, let me see, just think. Uh, well, of course, hopefully, where were we now? Oh, Friday, St Patrick's Day, St Patrick's Day. Looking forward to please got a few sessions there. Meet up with friends, and um, I've been fortunate to to to, to, to play it. Over the years, of course, I played a lot. Of, I didn't do. I, w- I was with some bands. I was with a lovely, a lovely band in the seventies, early seventies, with Kevin Burke and Tom Madden and Joe Palmer, called the Peelers, and that was lovely. And those bands, from time to time, you play with them for one, then, you, then then whatever, into another group or whatever. But I did a lot of sessions in between, which was lovely. You know, Tuesday night here or Thursday night there or whatever, and they're lovely because you meet people visiting people from America, from Italy, from France. From Australia, from whatever they're passing through, and they come in. Hello, what's your name? And that's lovely, isn't it? Meet people and join in with them, and you get to be friends. Then some of them become your some of your best friends. You know, it's just a wonderful thing, that isn't it? And people might come into the pub and say, "Oh, this is a nice group. How long have you been together?" And you say, "Well, about two hours." You know, they <laughs> think you've been in. The, you're a band, you've been, but that's what it is, isn't it? We just we meet up, and we've had, we've got these tunes that we've learned. We just play together. Fantastic thing, isn't it? And it's a lovely thing when people from all sorts of different countries around the world, they think, I like that, what you're doing. Oh, that was nice. Thank you, lads. Thank you, girls, boys and girls. If you can make a bit of happy, if you can bring a bit of happiness or lift somebody up, then it's a good thing, Andrew, isn't it, in this life? Any yeah. plans to come to Ireland? Yeah, well, yes, I've been invited. Please don't let me. I have to come over to the Nepibri Island. They've asked me to come to play in the cobblestone on Tuesday, June the 6th, I think it is, to just do a couple of short spots with my great friend Anton McGowan. Uh, I think it is it is actually Tuesday. Yeah, that's the date. Tuesday, I've written it down. I've made a note. I'm getting a bit organised here. Tuesday the 6th of June, the Cobblestone. Now, have you played at the Cobblestone, Ender? Uh, would you believe it? No. <laughs> uh, it's, a great, it's a great play. I believe so. Of course, music every night is fantastic, isn't it? To have sessions every night. And it nearly got closed down. They wanted to redevelop it, you know, but it was saved. Yeah. So it's I have these places like the, there's the Ferryman, I think, another one in Dublin, Hughes's. Oh, there's a good, there's, well, I don't know about Hughes's. Is that still going? But I'm pretty sure that one's gone. And uh, any pl- any plans to come over to the Flag Hill or Willie Clancy Week or any of those? Oh, yeah. Well, I should come to the my, my, uh, Bernadette McCarthy, my. Tommy McCarthy's daughter Bernadette. She said to me the last time I said, "You should be here every year," and I should be because that's a that's a wonderful week, isn't it? Um, I'd lo- I should go to that end now in July. I should make it my business, you know. But hopefully, please God, I, I want to come to the the All Island Flock, the old Mullingar, Mullingar for the Flour, about the eighth, about the tenth, twelfth, whatever it is of August for this year. Do, do, do you think you might uh, venture down into this time? I'll I'll be there this year for the first time in. Fifteen years, I'd say, oh. because because we we we've always been away in August at at uh, oh you're, you're Milwaukee, we are Milwaukee Irish Festival, but I'm doing a show with uh, with uh, four men and a dog. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, uh, well, as part of the band, or you're doing your own thing. 
I do my own. Yeah, do my own thing. I've figured out what it is. Yes. <laughs> well, th- th- this Friday end, I play play Scott in the Hammersmith Irish Centre in a session in the afternoon for St Patrick's Day, and four till seven, and at eight o'clock, four men and a dog coming on. They're in the hall. They're doing Saturday and Sunday. So, um, of course, all the boys, Stephen and Cal, and um, and, uh, and and Don Murphy and all the gang in it, and uh, and and. Uh, and Gino and Kevin, isn't it? So, so let me. So, when any idea what date your your one is? Uh, and, and for the, in Mullingar, I can't remember. But I'll I'll, I'll check that out. I'll yeah, check. I I think it's it's uh, the the the, the dogs. I know. I think it's something like the Monday or. Oh great! Excellent. Yeah, yeah, the I'll, they'll they'll know that they'll know the song. Well, I look forward to it. Well, it'd be lovely to meet you in uh, in in, in Mullingar now, especially as you say you haven't been for fifteen years. Well, you'll have to ring the banjo, and you can come up and play a set with me, Mick. Oh God! Oh, no, Ender, that'd be that'd be. I'd I'd like that. That'd be a lovely thing, wouldn't it? That'd be excellent. Sounds so, like it. Sounds like a day to me, Mick. Sounds like right. a day. I think we'll, we'll, we'll write that in the diary. My diary of events. Me, Ender, <laughs> Mullingar. <Mullingham. laughs> me, Ender. Ah, uh, and uh, so so Ender. I was going to say, have we nearly come to the end of our time, or have we? Well, I was going to say we're 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 at. An hour and fifteen, which that's a that's a, a fair swipe of time. We didn't quite hit the three hours, Mick, but I have a funny feeling I could go for dinner and come back and you'd only I, I, I get the feeling that we're only scratching the surface with all of the amazing musical escapades that you've had over many, many years. And it's an absolute pleasure to, to listen to you. Oh, well, and I hope I hope so. I'm glad to bored you to tears. I, I, I'm so sorry I had to wake you up there 20 minutes ago, really. It was really a bit much. <laughs> no, right. no, 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 I've no. had my coffee. Uh, oh, you've had the coffee. You've had the coffee. Great stuff. Well, Enda, I was going to say, uh, lovely to, well, we'll keep in contact, Enda. And you're, so that, I'm delighted that you, you'll send me the link for the Shackleton interview. That's yeah. a radio. Radio uh, one, yeah, and the friend for, for, for the listeners because it is a podcast after all. <laughs> it's oh, not just you and me chatting. Oh, I, yeah. I I'll put that in the link as well. Uh, uh, the link in in the show notes. That's what all the cool kids say, Mick. The link will be in the show notes, and I I I'll, I'll link to uh to you have a website I, I assume. It was the, I the band I play with is for the last twenty five years now. It is called Raggle Taggle with a W, like the Raggle Taggle Gypsy. So we're raggletaggle dot com and. That's got all the gigs and sessions and etc. What we do, Mick Bailey, myself, and Eugene Team and Butler Courtney, and um, so you, you can find any information there, sort of thing. So that's that's always good. Um, but I, I and I've really enjoyed being with them for such a long time. You know, we met so many nice people and gone to different places, and it's and many sessions, and it's good. You know, friends to keep friends. You know, like that. So it's it's always it's always a good thing. You know. Mm-hmm.